Hey, welcome back to WTF is Mon Monterey Theory. Oh, well, all I know is MMT. <coughs> Sorry. Um, anyway, no. Um, <coughs> I'm on chapter five. Life is full of trade offs. A private trade offs. Our personal uh, experience teaching teaches us that life is full of trade offs. Should I study for my calculus exam or close the movies? I'll enjoy the movies tremendously more than studying. But if I fail the exam, I might not graduate. Should I take uh, should I take an expensive vacation to the Bahamas or put the money into my IRA individual retirement account? Retirement is a long way of a long way out, and the vacation sure sounds nice. If you're taking basic economics classes, you learn about the rational consumer who carefully weighs something called utility, uh, which is a proxy for enjoyment that would be received from consuming a widget or, or a, gener a generic consumption good or service. The goal is to maximize total utility by consuming a basket of goods and services. This can get quite complex because there are so many possibilities. How can one obtain the right combo? You're going to need advanced math to make the right choices, so you'd better study calculus rather than going to the movies. What you want is to ensure that you get the same amount of utility from the very last unit of each one, of those consum consumables you consume. If you know calculus, you already are ahead of the game. You need to equate the marginal utilities of each. There is one more condition, you budge your, your budget constraint. You are limited in your purchases of consumables by your budget. That is, that in turn depends on your income. You must work to get income. Work is not fun. You'd rather go to the movies, so you'd so you'll need a bit more calculus to make the the right choice. You work because you want income, so you can buy consumables and maximize utilities subjects to your income or subject to your income constraint. <laughs> but you also want leisure. Work gives you this utility, the opposite of pleasure. Leisure gives you utility. How much should you work up to the point where the marginal disutility of work equals the marginal utility you can obtain from one last dollar of spending on your consumption basket? Woo, that was a difficult decision. You do this for every single item you purchase, indeed for every decision you make. Obviously, you can tell my emotions are not aren't exactly along with the words sometimes. Anyway. Marriage, lots of trade-offs. You must calculate the stream of utility you can get for all the possible mates. Since polygamy is ruled out in the U.S. and much of the rest of the world, choice of one eliminates the choice of others. You choose the mate that maximizes your lifetime worth of utility. Your mate's own utility doesn't concern you, but your mate's earning capacity will be concerned, uh, considered. Of course, all of your possible spouses are figured out the utility they'd get from marrying you compared against the pleasure, the pleasure that you they'd get from all their other possible marriage uh, meeting, the meetings. It's amazing that a successful pairing is ever achieved given the comp complex math involved in the decision making. There is a lot more to consumer choice theory that could be added, including an extended discussion of the nature of a rational man, which is presumed to be solely self-interested, completely unaffected by the happiness or pain of others, who has been, who has perfect foresight and no second thoughts about decision made decisions made. But Thorstein Veblen. The father of the institutional approach to economics famously summed up, summed it up to his tongue firm, uh, firmly in chief way. The hedonistic conception of man is that of a lightning uh, lightning lightning calculator of pleasures and pains, who uh, 
oscillates like a homogeneous uh, global uh, desire for happiness under the impulse of stimuli that shift him about the area but leave him intact. He has neither uh, antecedent nor consequent. He is an isolated, definitive uh, human datum and stable uh, equilibrium, except for the Buffett's uh, buffets, excuse me, the impairing forces that displace him in one direction or another. Self-poised in element space, he spins symmetrically about his own spiritual axis until the parallel the parallel parallel uh, forces bears down on on him. Where, whereupon he follows the line of the resultants. Consumers are not the only ones facing trade-offs. Investors must choose uh, among uh, alternatives. Should I invest in government bonds or corporate bonds? Should I build a new tire factory or get into refrigerator production? Should I hire more workers or replace them with robots? Or I might decide to hold safe financial assets instead of instead such decisions are constrained by budgets. Hence, we were we weigh marginal cost against the marginal revenues expected from every possible choice. Allocation or allocating, excuse me, our spending on investments such that the last dollar spent will generate the maximum feasible profits of the alternatives. Stripped of the complexity, the math, some extreme assumptions, and the jargon, all of this for uh, all of this is perfectly sensible. Of course, we must make choices, and of course, we face trade-offs. But we make lots of mistakes. We choose the movie, we perform poorly on our calculus exam, and we wind up in a two-year community, community college. We choose the wrong spouse and end up divorced, and divorce court judge awards the house to our former spouse. We often regret the choices we made and would do it all differently if we only if we only if only we had the second chance. Behavioral psychologists teach that humans are actually pretty bad at choosing. Choices are not made rationally, but rather are heavily influenced by evolu evolution. Which has a long reach across the millions of years of it, millions of years it took to produce humanoids. In many situations, we don't behave that much differently than our small brain ape ancestors. In truth, not that one, not much different from ant rats. And surprisingly, the more choices we face, the worse we do, just like rats. As the clash put it, we get all lost in the supermarket or in the supermarket with the clipped coupons and looking for the special offers, unable to make a choice. Best to just grab the first item, uh, first item store management has helpfully placed right at eye level. Beyond that, there are two problems with the trade off approach to decision making. We already touched on one earlier. Investments today can relax tomorrow's budget constraints. Studying for your calculus exam can get you higher paying jobs in the future, which raises your lifetime earnings. Pushing that budget constraints out, letting you consume more of everything. The firm that invests in a new factory raises profits potential for the future, meaning more investments later. Furthermore, the prospects prospect of a higher future income makes it possible to access credit, which relieves the budget constraint. In addition to your income, you're, you can borrow and spend beyond today's income. If all turns out as expected, tomorrow's income will be, will be higher too. Budget constraints are not fixed. To be sure, this does not completely invalidate the conventional approach to decision making. You still must allocate spending to maximize utility or consumer or profit firm or firm. And making a choice means not taking the alternative. And the decision to invest in education or factories is a decision into postpone consumption, which is said to depend on the rat the rate of time for preference, essentially uh, thriftness, save now, consume more later because you can earn interest. 
that is taken, taken to be different across individuals, but largely left unexplained. Some people are, some people's, some people's, yeah, are presumed to be naturally more thrifty, thrifty than others. Saving rates are low in English speaking nations and high in uh, Asian, Asian nations. Asian nations, double check that. Yep, yeah, in, in the high in Asian nation, nations. Uh, maybe there are just no English words to let you let you say no to credit. The second problem with the approach is more important and is based on a different difference between individuals and society as a whole. At the level of the individual, it is reasonable to argue that income is the main determinant of spending, with the caveat that today's income can't be sub supplemented by borrowing. Perhaps we do not do too much damage to reality by presuming that individuals face an income constraint, hence spending faces a trade-off given, given income. But at the level of the economy as a whole, spending determines income at the aggregate level. Society can always decide to spend more if oh no, it cannot simply de decide to have more income. All the spending must end up as income. Every dollar spent gets, re gets received by someone. This is the way that our national accounting is set up. Total spending, or GDP, equals total income, gross national income, or GNI. Uh, that was GMI or was GNI? Uh, GPI. Or, uh, yeah, that was gross product. Oh, anyway. <laughs> anyway, our budget constraint is determined by our spending, not the other way around. If we spend more, the income constraint is larger than the nation as a whole. But how can we but how can we as a nation spend more than our income? Well, we cannot because whatever we spend becomes our income, but we can spend more than last year's income, which makes this year's income greater than last year's. That is how GDP and GNI grow every year outside recessions and depressions. And government spends more too, increasing income. The general trend is always up because each year we decide to spend more and that increases our income. How can we keep doing this after year after year? The key, of course, is credit. Private financial institutions create money to finance spending and government creates money to finance its spending. Together, they create, together that creates income and growing income allows us to make the payments on the debt from the past. Trying to extra, extrapolate from individual behavior and constraints to the aggregate almost always leads to wrong conclusion. It is such a common mistake that we have name that we have a name for it: policy of uh, composition, and indeed a whole print, uh, print, print, excuse me, a whole branch of e economics called macroeconomics is devoted to trying to correct the errors. What is true at the individual level is almost never true at the aggregate. The reverse is also valid. What is you true at the aggregate is almost never true at the individual level. If you continually try to spend more than your income, you probably would find that your income wouldn't increase at least not sufficiently and you'd end up in the poorhouse. But if we all, if all of us try to spend more than our income, we, we at the nation the national level would find our higher income. Or income higher, excuse me. It is thus wrong to think uh, think if at the aggregate level we spend more at one, uh, on one thing, then we must spend less on something else. That's just not correct. We can spend more on both. And now we'll conclude with this reading for the moment. Uh, the next one would be B, public trade-offs. But I want to address something else. I keep, now I'm I'm a socialist as far as economic uh, economies. And I'm aware of the so-called past socialist countries um, and current socialist countries. And there are mitigating circumstances in why they're failing. And it has nothing to do with socialist policies. It has everything to do with capitalist constraints. And one of the precursors to socialism was Marxism, apparently. 
And I've seen quite a few Marxists recently try to put in the same category as government spending and the worth of being a reserve, uh, a currency reserve around the world and military. Very different things from what I've seen. Military, a lot of times will will defend a country that may be an ally in regards to trade. Um, that's why we got involved in the uh, first Gulf War, because of Saudi Arabia, uh, Kuwait. Um, Co uh, Kuwait was attacking, uh, trying to steal oil, I guess, uh, from Saudi Arabia. That's where we stepped in and stopped Saddam Hussein at that time. Uh, now, a lot of people like to, like to talk about the petrodollar. As far as I know about, the reason why they take the USD, and that's why they call it the petrodollar, is because we take more of, uh, we buy more of their product than any other country in the world, um, even though we produce our own as well. That's as far as I know of. Uh, I could be wrong about that part, but that's as far as I know of. Anyway, the US dollar is quite literally just what you call the paper messenger. Capitalists use it to purchase uh, capital, you know, housing, cars, whatever the fuck the case may be. Uh, the USD itself is just a medium of exchange. In other words, if we didn't have capital, if we, did, if we had socialism, we had communism, whatever, if we still used the dollar as a medium of exchange, it would still hold its own value because it purchases product. It pays people to work. It pays people to be retired, like myself. So it's not the me. It's not the dollar that that uh, that is the problem. Is the economic system using the dollar to purchase and to to uh, keep their their wealth? Uh, so when people. Marxists, especially in regards to some Marxists, not all, some, uh, want to say that how what the what fiat currency is, or uh, that we have to borrow from corporations. There's quite a few people in in, in the same uh, uh, conversation. Rook scholar a couple of days ago uh, said exactly said exactly what was true. Why would you borrow? money from the same people you give tax breaks to that makes no sense whatsoever um so the marxists who say that are like rich wolf for instance uh who uh says we borrow from if we can't borrow from from corporations we'll borrow from china or some or somewhere like that he's an he's an economist he should know that According to the Constitution, the Congress has the sole right to issue new currency. They kind of screwed up as far as the the sequence. They don't tax. They don't tax before they spend. They spend before they tax. Uh, so I mean, I as far as that part goes, I can only guess it's because of the fact that they had to make the money to purchase the the labor in order to make the money in order to be able to invest in whatever they're going to invest in then they they uh they uh did the constitution but because they because they taxed a lot of the money out they they thought that well we'll just kind of start with the tax and that we'll start with the taxing out before we put the money which is actually the opposite um anyway my point being is don't go after the messenger. Go after the person doing the damage. So that's that's my thought on that. And MMT has the the textbook has gone through what Marxist uh, uh, said and did and critiqued it, just like just like they critiqued every. Uh, economic theory out there. That's the reason why I think that MMT is not a theory, but is 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 a description of what the current the currency uh, of fiat is in this country and how it works under a flexible exchange rate, under 
uh, having no outside of your currency debts, paying all your debt both internationally and domestically in the same currency. That's what a lot of that's what a lot of countries have a problem with, and that's why capitalists tend to think that MMT is what Sri Lanka is doing, which actually Sri Lanka owes I, IMF like forty like forty million dollars or something like that, which was actually accumulated in USD. So, I mean. It's the sequence of which people owe. It's not the, it, it, it's, yeah. Anyway, that's what I got to say as far as that part goes. Uh, if you subscribe, I appreciate it. Thank you. If you follow me on uh, TikTok, uh, Calvin Taylor uh, 666 on there, I'm trying to get to a thousand uh, followers so I can go live with reading and whatever MMT related material. Anyway, thanks for listening. Subscribe. Don't dis- don't subscribe, but at least share and like. But most importantly to me anyway, um, for now, please go on to TikTok and follow at Calvin Taylor 666. Thank you and peace out for the moment. And actually, you know what? This is the book I was reading, by the way. You can get this on growprogressive.org. You can also go on Amazon, I think. You can also, if you're in Canada, you can get Spartacus.net, I believe. They order it for you as well. Anyways, here's the top of the moment.